Revelation chapter 7, I mentioned this last week, uh, deals with two groups of people. And um, come on, give me some air here. There we go. That did it. Two groups of people. And the first group, and to me, this makes all the sense in the world. And I'll, and I'll just be honest. I'll, some people agree with me, some people don't. And that's fine. I can handle it. I've got pastor friends that I love dearly. I'd do anything in the world for them. Uh, but they don't necessarily see things my way. I don't necessarily see things their way. We don't get into it. Um, when I go to their churches, I don't try to press upon their people how they're wrong on everything. I don't do that. Uh, I don't have too many friends in the ministry, um, and the ones I have, I like to keep because they're good men. And um, but there are some that see things a little differently uh, than what has commonly been taught. Uh, and what I'm referring to is what is referred to as a pre-tribulational rapture. Now let me explain what that means. Um, that we all agree, the Bible teaches very plainly that Christ is going to come and he's going to reign a thousand years on the earth. Okay? Um, he's going to return with his saints, which we believe is us, because we have been resurrected or or translated, those are the two Bible words, those who have died in Christ already uh, at that day will be resurrected. Those who are alive in Christ on that day will be changed, will be translated, will be get our, we'll get our new body without having to die out of the old one. Okay, I don't know what's going to happen with the old one, don't care. It's just the new one is going to be we're going to get the new one, all right? Now, there is a, a doctrine, and it's been taught for about the last 180 years, that there is a period called the Great Tribulation, and that it lasts seven years. Okay, now... I've read the Bible, and I have never seen any scripture that speaks of seven years of tribulation. Not one. Um, and I don't want to. I don't want to get into all where they get it from. But I just, I don't see it. And if I don't see it in scriptures, I, I can't teach it and I can't believe it. Um, but there are things that I believe are going to happen pretty much simultaneously. And Revelation 7, to me, is perfect with that. And that is, God is going to save Israel... And restore his work with them. And he's going to translate the Gentile believers. Resurrect the dead in Christ. They when we, we, which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Um, and let me, give you a, let me give you a verse. Paul said this, I think it's in Romans. Uh, Beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery. That blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in or something like that. And what that tells me is, is that there is a time when God is going to remove the veil that's on the Jews right now. Paul said there's a veil on Israel 
when they read the Old Testament, there's a veil over their eyes. They can't see what the Old Testament really is about. They don't understand it. They read it. They have it memorized in cases, but they don't know what it's about. We, to us, who believe the New Testament, it's easy. All, this, all the symbols and all the things in the Old Testament represent Christ. Moses, Christ. The rock that followed Moses, Christ. Aaron the high priest, Christ. The lamb that was slain is Christ. Okay? The water that came out of the rock, that's Christ. Everything. David is a picture of Christ. Solomon is a picture of Christ. I mean, you have Christ all over the New Old Testament. The Jews can't see it. They, they cannot see that. So one of these days, God's going to, he's going to heal their eyes. They're going to, their eyes are going to be opened and they're going to see it now. They're going to understand it. They're going to get it. Jeremiah 31, 31, where God promises them, he's going to give them a new covenant, not like the covenant that he made with their fathers at Mount Sinai, but basically the New Testament. Christ died on the cross for the Jew first, Paul said, then the Gentile. Look at the order you have in Revelation 7. You have the Jew first, then you have the Gentiles mentioned. And when we get to verse 9, after, you know, we're going to look at the 12 tribes first. When we get to verse 9, um, He's going to explain who this great multitude is. And we're going to study some words in the Bible. I showed you last week how I study. Okay. And I and I I've put out a challenge before and I'll challenge anyone now. To show me in the scriptures a seven year tribulation okay now i'm not gonna put money behind it unless gary wants to loan me some okay but anyway that's i'm just letting you know where i'm headed with this now last sunday uh we looked at these four winds and we're going to continue with that this morning Revelation 7, 1, after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Uh, look at verse 2. Uh, and I saw another angel ascending from the east. Do I have that in my notes here? No. Um, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And so, by the way, just to let you know, uh, that coming up in this study, we're going to study a number and that number is the number 12. We're going to see what it means, what it represents, why there are 12 tribes, why were there 12 apostles, uh, why is there 144,000 uh, and so on and so on and so on. We'll study that and we'll have some fun with it because I, I love numbers in the Bible. Uh, take your Bible now to turn to Daniel because this is part of that four winds. This is part of what God is going to do here, he's withholding the four winds, but he's withholding it for a reason. He's going to seal the 12 tribes and then he's going to, uh, he's, he's go there's some things he's holding back, in other words. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 1. Uh, and this, to me, is very... I, there's a lot of things I don't understand out of the book of Daniel. And there's, I believe, a reason for that. 
Um, you have two books. They're both the 27th book of each testament. Daniel's the 27th book of the Old Testament. Revelation, 27th book of the New Testament. And uh, Daniel, specifically, it said, seal up the words, seal up the prophecy. And so Daniel is sealed. There's understanding here that we can't understand because it hasn't been unsealed yet. When will it be unsealed? When Christ starts unsealing the book, I believe, that he holds in his hand. Revelation, of course, is not sealed. And so I think its understanding is plain. I think, I think it means what it says. If you see a beast with seven heads and ten horns, guess how many heads it's going to have? Seven. How many horns is it going to have? Ten. How many crowns? Ten. Okay. I think it's just as plain as the nose on your face. Um, anyway, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Belshazzar was the offspring of Nebuchadnezzar, the heir to the throne, in other words. Nebuchadnezzar's gone. Belshazzar now is king. King of Babylon. Daniel had a dream. And visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream. And told the sum of the matters. It's interesting that in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Daniel knows the dream and he knows the interpretation of it. Then later on, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream in Daniel 4. And doesn't understand it. And Daniel's giving him the understanding of that. A tree being cut down and so on. And it's about, it's about Nebuchadnezzar becoming uh, like a beast. And a, the, a beast's heart was given to him for seven times, the Bible says. Uh, some say that's seven years. It just says seven times is what it says. Uh, and now Daniel is having his own dream. And he's going to write it down. And he's written it down and we have it for us now. So verse 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of the heaven. Now I, I believe that these are the four winds referred to in Daniel, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 7. They're being withheld because... Those four winds are going to hurt the earth, he said. So they're going to hold them back until the 12 tribes are sealed. But when these four winds are released, here's what's going to happen. They're going to strive. Uh, behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great See, what happens when wind blows on the sea? Waves, okay? Big, huge waves. Study waves in the Bible. Especially like in um, the book of Psalms. The waves that came over. What was uh, the disciples in the boat? What were they worried about? The waves. And they, Jesus in the boat taking a nap. And Brother Reg Kelly preached this one here one time. He said, you, this is the stupidest question ever in the Bible. Stupidest question anybody could have asked in the Bible. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Of course he carries, cares whether or not we perish. Amen. He died on the cross. He cares whether or not we perish. So anyway, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And this is going to stir up something and release something verse three four great beasts came up from the sea now when you have the number four you have you're dealing with the spiritual realm you're dealing with either the true gospel or you're dealing with the false gospel and a false savior a false Jesus, another Jesus, the way Paul put it in 2 Corinthians, okay? Um, and he said, um, 
Four great beasts, verse 3, came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Now, this four tells you that this is in the spiritual realm. It tells you like what Paul said in Ephesians. Uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we're dealing with spirits here. We're dealing with a creature in the spiritual realm that actually looks like a lion, and it has eagle's wings. Uh, take your Bible, hold your place there in Daniel. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, there's a whirlwind comes out of the north. And if you look in verse 5. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. There's that number four again. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. But, and the word we would use for that now is humanoid. They have a humanoid appearance. In other words, they sort of look like us, but they're not like us. In verse 6. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. So that's not quite like us, is it? No. And their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. That's not humans don't have calf's feet. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. OK, we don't we don't have that color. Verse 8, and, the, and they had the hands of a man under their wings and on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched up uh, upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. So basically you're dealing in Ezekiel 1, even though they look like a man, they have the body of a man, a humanoid appearance. They have these different faces. They have wings. So obviously, and the Bible calls them cherubim. These are uh, of the realm of the of the angels. All right. Now, when you go back to Daniel chapter seven. Uh, let's see here. In verse four, the first, the first of the beasts that came up out of the sea was like a lion. So this was a spiritual beast. He has a lion and he had eagle's wings. Now, a lot of scholars have tried to make um, these four beasts like four nations. Um, some things that I've read by the way, there was a book written uh, probably 50 years ago called The Antichrist and a Cup of Tea. And it had a lot of people believing it, and some people still do, I think. It had the idea that Prince Charles was going to be the Antichrist. Okay, well, now he is King Charles. Okay, and... Um, to my knowledge, I think they said he is the, uh, the oldest of the kings of England or the monarchs of England to ever take the throne. And it's because his mother lived so long. His mother lived so long because 
I don't know if you know too much about uh, her father and her grandmother and all this. They were heavy smokers and heavy drinkers, okay? And um, King George, who was Elizabeth II's father, very heavy smoker, and he died, uh, and that left her being queen at a young age. So she was queen after World War II all the way up until now, and to my knowledge, she didn't smoke. I think she, you know, drank socially when they, when they had state dinners or whatever, but you could tell that she took care of herself, lived, lived, to, you know, to, and was pretty, doing pretty well until Prince Philip died, her husband, and she started going downhill from there. But anyway, uh, so who knows how long King Charles is going to live. I don't believe he's the Antichrist, okay? But what they did was they read Daniel chapter 7, and they said, ah, a lion with eagle's wings. Well, that's one of the symbols that's on the, um, one, the, the banner of England, I forgot what they call them, the shield or whatever. It's a lion with eagle's wings, okay? Well, there's been a lot of other nations and people of royalty who have taken on this thing of a lion with eagle's wings, probably because they read it out of the Bible. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that this kingdom is the kingdom of Great Britain and that there's, there's somehow some great terrible beast that's going to take over the earth. Okay? I don't believe that. However, I do believe that this beast is, according to uh, Ephesians 6, a principality. A principality spirit is a spirit that rules over um, a, a group of people, a nation, and so on. We get that from the book of Daniel. Remember when Daniel prayed and asked God for his request, and he waited and waited, and it was like 21 days before the angel Gabriel showed up, and he said, I've got, I finally got your answer here. You know, what took so long? Well, the prince of the people of Persia withstood me. And what that means was, it wasn't the king of Persia. It was a very, very powerful, probably Satan himself, withstood this angel and would not let him pass. But then Michael, the prince of the people of Israel. Israel has an angel that is a principality angel that is on their side. And it's Michael, the archangel. So the prince of Israel came and fought this prince of Persia and defeated him so that Gabriel could come and deliver the message. And so, yes, I do believe that over certain areas there are devils that have dominion over people. And if you go to certain places... They could be small places like someone's house. Sometimes you go in somebody's house and you just feel something ain't right there. There's a principality there. Okay? There is a, there is a devil that rules over that family. And that family is 100% under the dominion of that of that devil okay sometimes they are over larger groups um, uh, what what example could I use well I'll say this uh, I won't get into the story but God dealt with me about I treated some Jehovah's witness that came to my door I treated them really bad I mean really bad and God dealt with me George about my attitude so i went to the king i went to their kingdom hall over here on 110 highway i thought they were from there and i went on a thursday night because that's when they had their meeting and i walked in that building 
And I want to tell you something. There was a spirit in that building. Bad. And I felt it. I, I did not want to stay there. I just told them that there was a couple ladies. I didn't know if they were from there. I wanted to apologize to them. They said, they're, they're not, you're not in our district. That's over in Cedar Hill. Uh, Brady Crum was part of that back then. And I told him to tell those two ladies that I was sorry for the way I treated them. Okay. But I went in that building and there was a principality spirit in that building. Okay. Um, if, if you talk to Tim Barron's, he goes in these Mormon churches, these Mormon wards, they call them. And there are principality spirits in there. And those spirits keep those people blind to the gospel. So Tim Barron's goes in there and he starts talking. And when he starts talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, guys start getting up out of their pews to t t literally take him and physically remove him from their building. And it just one in one place, it just so happened that a, a local deputy sheriff went to that ward and he took pictures of Tim's car and his license plate. And he said, I'm putting you on notice now that if you show up to any ward in this county, you are, you are trespassing and you will be arrested. Okay? Well, that's a principality that does that. Okay? So I, I believe that this lion with eagle's wings is a principality. Now look at what happens. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. So what happens when a flying creature has wings, but the wings get plucked off? Can't fly anymore. Okay. Thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth, made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So we have, now think about this. In Daniel 4, we had Nebuchadnezzar, who was a man, but he had a beast's heart given to him. And what did he do? He was out in the backyard eating grass. Okay? Crawling around on his all fours. Had his hair in dreadlocks and things like that. His fingernails grew like talons. And he was that way until God removed that from him. And now he stands up as a man. Here we have a beast that its wings are taken off and it stands on its feet as a man and a man's heart is given to it. Which means, now I want you to think about this. The heart, not just the beating heart that we have, but in the Bible, what does the heart represent? Do what? The four Gospels, yeah. Um, let me quote this. Um, For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The heart is the seat of the human soul. It is... Y'all come on in. We're just doing Sunday school, waiting for the bell to ring. Uh, but anyway, the heart is what gives us our consciousness, our ability to know that we are alive and present in this world right now. Animals don't know that. A cow, when you see a cow out in the field, he's not thinking of his future and what he wants to be when he grows up. Right? He doesn't think about, I wonder how many children I want to have. He doesn't think that way. He cannot, a cow or a dog or a chicken or an earthworm or a beetle or a goldfish, they cannot understand nor recognize their own existence. Only man can do that. So here we have a beast. And it has a beast 
nature. And let, let me explain that the way I had it explained to me one time. And I like this illustration. Uh, let's say, Chris, that you heard a noise 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, somebody is trying to come in your house. You know they're there. So you grab baseball bat or whatever of your choice and you can hear them coming down the hall so you get just inside of a room and as they walk past you they accidentally step on your toe but you don't want them to know they're there do you have the ability to not scream i mean do you have the ability to to not go ah! like that you have that ability and it's because you don't want him to know you're there. You're thinking ahead and you're thinking rationally and you're waiting for this guy to get by you so you can whatever you're going to do to it. However, if a dog was laying there and this guy came by and stepped on that dog's paw, does he have the ability to not cry out? No. No. He can't. That's his nature. Animals have a nature that they cannot circumvent. The devil is a dragon. He's a serpent. He's not like us. He has a nature and a way about him that he cannot circumvent. He cannot get around it. This beast here is going to be different. He is going to be taken as a beast, stand up like a man, and be given a man's heart, which means that whatever this is, he is going to be able to think in a rational way and understand his own existence and, and desire his own future, if that makes sense to everybody. That's what, so we're working on, I say we, technology is working on mixing human DNA in with animals. Is that a good idea? There's nothing about that that's a good idea. Nothing. Because giving... Giving a chimpanzee, chimpanzee, you remember this chimp out here on Highway CC that killed it? They have four times the strength of a human. They're smaller than us, but they can, they can literally tear a human being to shred. And that's what they did. That's what that one chimp did. I was watching something about it the other day. But anyway, giving a chimpanzee the mental capacity of a human, not a good idea. Giving a dog the mental capacity of a human, not a good idea. But I promise you, somewhere, somebody's trying it. Because humans have this, humans have a curiosity about them. What if I did this? What if I added this to this? Whoever decided that, what does it take to make meth? Uh, cold, cold pills and Drano and ammonia. Let's mix this together and see what happens. Here, smoke this, see what happens. Okay? Not a good idea for mankind at all. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. We ask your blessings, Father, upon this service this morning. Pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless and honor your word in this place. We thank you for it in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.